this lecture is dedicated to cosmological perturbations. Cosmological perturbations are a crucial ingredient to understand the formation of structures and evolution of structures in the universe, where by structures we mean galaxies, clusters of galaxies, but even stars and planets. Uh, the idea is that the universe started uh, in a sort of homogeneous and isotropic state, but then it evolved into a situation which is much more complex and uh, it uh, describes a situation in which you have uh, all these uh, structures like galaxies, clusters, etc. Okay? So the, the, it's important in starting this discussion to uh, make a, a short historical introduction. Uh, the reason being that um, Sir James Jeans, at the beginning of the last century, uh, was essentially the first to discuss uh, how uh, a medium made of self-gravitating um, fluid elements, self-gravitating particles, gave rise to uh, what we now call the Jeans instability or gravitational instability. The idea is very simple. What he did was to take the equations which govern the evolution of a fluid, which basically means continuity, uh, Euler equation, and the Poisson equation to account for the source of the gravitational force, and uh, it looked at small perturbations. That was the, the very simple idea by, by James. In uh, trying to solve this problem, he had to make an answer. The answer uh, has to do with the choice of the background solution. Uh, the background solution chosen by James was a so-called static solution. In other words, he assumed the uh, mass density to be uniform and constant in time. He assumed uh, zero velocity for the background, and he also assumed a constant and uniform uh, gravitational potential. Uh, this choice of background is actually not self-consistent, especially the last statement cannot make sense because it is impossible to have a non-zero uh, mass density and at the same time a constant gravitational potential. In spite of that, Jeans uh, was able to find very important and interesting results out of these system of equations by looking at perturbations around uh, this uh, background, uh, background solution. It's important to, to, to notice the following. What Jeans found was an exponential growth of perturbations are above a certain scale that we now call the gene scale. The qualitative result is correct. The quantitative co result instead is to be correct, as, as we are going to see, uh, to see soon. Uh, the gene's orientation stability is known nowadays to be the cause of structure formation in the universe at any scale. A homogeneous anisotropic universe, and though with some tiny initial density perturbation seeds, uh, will unavoidably evolve into a complex network of gravitational bound objects such as, as I mentioned before, galaxies, clusters, uh, etc. Uh, so that, that is the start of the game. We, we are not now going to, to improve this treatment by accounting for a self-consistent uh, solution of the problem. Let, before doing that, let me make some comments on the results by genes. I'm not going to, into details of the, of the derivation by genes, but I'm going to tell you some important aspects. What you do is to write down the equations, you linearize around the, 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 the background, you linearize around the background, and uh, you, you write equation for perturbations, you go to Fourier space, and at some point you arrive to the so-called dispersion relation. The dispersion relation uh, connects the oscillation frequency omega to the wave number and uh, through uh, the speed of sound, Cs, and the, uh, the mean mass density uh, of, the, of the, the system in this situation. Uh, what, you, what you can easily see from this equation here is that uh, for low enough wave numbers, uh, omega squared becomes negative. In other words, omega becomes uh, imaginary. Okay? The very fact that you have imaginary solution implies that you have uh, uh, an exponential growth, or, or if you like, an exponential decay also, uh, of your perturbations. This exponential growth will uh, uh, occur only for wavelengths uh, uh, such that this object is less than this one. So the genes wavelength is equal to the speed of sound divided by the square root of 4 pi g times the mean, mean density of the system. Why is this, uh, this instability there? The instability is there because uh, we only have uh, attractive 
gravitational force. We don't have any negative charges, let me say, from the gravitational point of view, contrary to what happens in uh, plasma, for instance, in which the, the you have uh, electrostatic uh, oscillations. Uh, in that case, you do have screaming mechanisms. Uh, in this case, we don't have any screaming mechanisms. So, gravitational stability is an unavoidable consequence of the very fact that gravity can only be attractive. Now, you can ask yourself, uh, we saw that there was a problem. The problem is the, the, is the choice of the background solution. Uh, but you can say, OK, the perturbation uh, seems to uh, evolve in a, in a physical, uh, meaning, meaningful way. Uh, can we try to uh, go on in this direction and use this approach also in a, in a more correct cosmological context? Let me just mention that the physical understanding of what happened is very simple to, to, to see. I mean, what, what happens is that uh, the gravitational stability uh, occurs any time, the free fall time, which is uh, proportional to 1 over the square root of 0, is less than the hydrodynamical time, which is the scale of the perturbation divided by the speed of sound. So you can ask yourself, uh, uh, if the, the free fall time was much smaller than the expansion time of the universe, what we call the Hubble time, then in principle you could continue to use this approach. Unfortunately, this is not the case, because the free fall time is the same order of magnitude of the Hubble time. Okay? So, uh, the expansion of the universe is going to affect very strongly the way in which gravitational stability occurs in the universe. Having said that, let me uh, try to see how we can deal with the uh, universe expansion in this context. The idea uh, is very simple. What you can do is the following. Let's choose physical or proper co coordinates R, uh, defined as being the scale factor of the universe A of t times the uh, coordinate x of t, which is uh, commoving with respect to the background friedman robinson worker uh, metric. If you do that, then you can rewrite all the equations that genes had used by simply interpreting the coordinate used by genes as being this, uh, this uh, physical, physical coordinate r. First of all, you have to define what the velocity is. The velocity will be the time derivative of this object, so uh, it will be r dot, the dot meaning uh, differentiation with respect to time, um, and that quantity is the derivative of the, say, the, the first object, a dot, times x, that is times r divided by a, plus the derivative of the second object multiplied by the scale factor. The interpretation of these two terms is very simple. The first term is nothing else than what we call the Hubble flow. In other words, it is the Hubble relation in a, in a, Newtonian, uh, in a Newtonian approximation. The second term instead is called the peculiar velocity. Okay? It is the excess or uh, with a plus or minus in front of that uh, velocity that an object, a fluid element, or even a galaxy has with respect to the overall expansion of the universe. Now, uh, with these co coordinates, we can just write the standard Newtonian equations for a self-gravitating fluid. We have the continuity equation, mass conservation, the Euler equation, momentum conservation, and the Poisson equation, which connects the gravitational potential with the mass density, the local mass density in the universe. So rho is the mass density, p the pressure, phi the gravitation potential. OK, uh, before proceeding, let me make this comment, which is very useful for what follows. Suppose that we are considering a certain function, generic function f, uh, which depends upon position and time, OK? And we take the, the total time derivative of this, of this function f, OK? Uh, you can uh, think uh, of the function f as, being, uh, as depending on r and t, hmm? physical coordinate and time. Okay? If you do that, then when you take the total time derivative, you can have the partial derivative with respect to time at fixed r plus r dot uh, internal grad f, hmm? which can rewrite by accounting for the fact that r dot contains the two terms we said before, Hubble flow and peculiar velocity. On the other hand, you can also think the function f is depending on commoving coordinate x and time. Uh, if you take the time derivative, the total time derivative of this function, by thinking f this way, you only have two terms. You have 
the partial derivative respect to time at fixed x, no longer fixed r, plus x dot uh, grad f. Now, by definition, the two derivations should give the same result because at the end of the day, you're just taking the total derivative of function f. If you compare these two, you get the, simple, the following simple rule. The partial derivative respect to time of f at constant r is equal to the, function, the partial derivative of f respect to time at constant x minus this extra term here, minus h r rad respect to r of f. That would be very useful in the, in the following discussion. The, now, the, the idea is quite simple. We want to, to get rid of the background contributions to these equations. That is, we, are, we want to end up with a situation in which we will have fluid equations only written in terms of x and t, okay? And possibly uh, the subtracting all the purely background terms in the evolution of the equations. In order to do that, let's do the following. First of all, we write down the, the local mass density as the sum of a background contribution, which I will call rho b of t, plus a perturbation delta rho. Okay? I can also rewrite the expression by factoring out rho b of t and say that this quantity multiplies 1 plus delta. This quantity delta is very much used by cosmologists. It is the fractional density perturbation delta rho divided by the mean rho. Similarly, what you can do is to uh, define a background uh, gravitational potential, which is nothing else than the one defined from the background density rho b of t. Hmm? So you try to solve the Poisson equation for this background gravitational potential, and you get a very simple and meaningful solution. Phi b is equal to 2 pi g divided by 3 times the mean density times r squared. You may immediately notice that this phi b is not a constant. That was the main, let me call it mistake, quote unquote mistake, made by genes in his treatment. Now, if you subtract uh, from phi, phi b, you get a new uh, phi, I will call it peculiar gravitational potential, which satisfies a Poisson equation in which instead of having the complete mass density, you only have the perturbation delta, okay? Uh, you can rewrite this equation in this very simple way. Laplace of respect to x of small phi is equal to 4 pi g times the background mass density times the square root of the scale factor times the uh, density fluctuation at delta. Okay, now let's go step by step in the derivation of the new equations uh, for our fluid. Let me start with the continuity equation, okay? So we had this continuity equation, which we wrote before. We can rewrite this by opening this divergence term. So you have two contributions, one coming from rho and one coming from, from uh, w. You uh, notice that the divergence of r is equal to 3, very, very trivially. And you finally attain this very simple form in which I exploited my relation for the total derivative of a generic function f, which in this case would be the, the mass density rho. So we arrive to this very simple uh, relation. The partial derivative of the mass density respect to time at fixed uh, uh, position uh, x plus 3h rho plus 1 over a divergence with respect to x of rho v is equal to 0. Notice that uh, if you drop this term, okay, if you say there is no peculiar velocity, you will just recover the standard evolution of the mass density in the expanding universe, whose solution is the rho proportional to uh, uh, 1 over a cube, 1 over the, the cube of the scale factor. Okay? But we do have perturbations, and we do have a non-zero peculiar velocity to account for. So the, the, this is our new continuity equation that we're going to use in the following. Let me go to the Euler equation. In the Euler equation, what you, you, you start from here, okay, and you have uh, the partial derivative of the overall velocity with respect to time at fixed r, plus this term, which is nonlinear at the velocity, okay? It has to do with the fact that I have to follow the fluid lines. So this contribution has to do with the so-called Lagrangian derivative, okay? It is the derivative of the fluid which follows the, flu the, the fluid lines. Then we have two, two terms on the right-hand side. A term arising from the pressure gradients, 
And another term arises from the gravitational force, which is, of course, the gradient of the gravitational potential. Okay, so you go on, you follow the same, uh, the same procedure that we used before. You, you, there are two contributions to W, which give rise to these two terms. You also have to open these many terms here, because there are two terms here and two terms here, and you go on, you write this, this long expression here, okay? In this expression, you may easily notice that there are a number of terms, actually, which only have to do with the background, okay? You can easily recognize them. This term, okay? Uh, then there is this term here, no perturbations, and there is another term, which is, uh, which is this one, okay? No perturbations. So, we would expect that these three terms sum to zero. Hmm? Now, if you do, so let's see if they actually sum to zero uh, on the basis of the background solution of our universe, okay? In order to, uh, to see that, we can rewrite the first term. It is actually the partial derivative of hr with respect to t at fixed r. So if it is at fixed r, you only have to differentiate h, so you have h dot times r. Then you have this term here, h multiplying r, grad r, uh, operating on hr, and that will give you this uh, object, a squared ri, partial derivative with respect to r, uh, ri of rj times this unit vector ej. And then you have this term, this term, uh, uh, the, this um, term here, which is also very simple, very simple to get, because we know what the phi b is. We wrote it down before, it was proportional to r squared, so you get this, this result here, okay? Hence, you put together these two terms and you arrive to this equation here, okay? If this object is equal to zero, it means that you have this, this object here equal to zero because you, can, you have r in both terms. Now, as a matter of fact, this equation is nothing else than the acceleration equation in the Friedman set of equations, uh, what can be called the second Friedman equation, a dot, equal to minus 4 pi g divided by 3 rho b times a, in other words. In deriving this result, we also made use of the continuity equation uh, written this way, which applies to the background evolution. If we have pressure, what we are saying here is that the background pressure is negligible in this discussion. And uh, you are, we arrived to this set of equations, and we dropped the background contributions. Uh, so we have partial derivative of the velocity at fixed x plus hv, plus this nonlinear term, now in terms of v, no longer in terms of w, and then we have these two extra terms on the right-hand side, pressure gradient and gravitational force. The pressure gradient term should be dealt with in a, uh, in a more precise form, but let me simplify the game and assume that we only are considering adiabatic modes. In such a case, the gradient of the pressure can be written as being proportional to the gradient of the mass density through a proportionality constant, which is the square of the speed of the adiabatic speed of sound of our fluid. Now, let me summarize the situation so far. We were able to derive the mass density uh, continuity equation. Okay, which you have the, a, a very familiar form, another familiar form, plus these three h rho. We have the new Euler equation in which we differentiate respect to time at fixed x, which was our final goal. So we have this familiar term, this familiar term, we written in terms of v, no longer in terms of w, plus this extra term, hv. Uh, and we have the, the pressure gradient and the gravitational force term. Notice that now the gravitational force only involves the peculiar gravitational potential whose source is the density fluctuation, no longer the overall, uh, the overall mass density in the system. In the case of adiabatic perturbations, this set of three equations plus the background ones forms a closed set which can be uh, solved. Okay, solving the previous set of equations, which is called the Euler-Poisson system, is not at all a trivial, a trivial uh, goal. Indeed, there are no analytical solutions of this system, except for very specific cases, very special cases, which corresponds, for instance, to situations in which you have strong symmetry, spherical symmetry, planar symmetry, cylindrical symmetry. Uh, otherwise, what you can do is either to use numerical 
techniques and body simulations or try to use perturbation theory. The lowest level of perturbation theory is the linear theory, which I'm going to discuss in what follows, which will be a, an extension, an improvement, a generalization of what Gins had done assuming static uh, background solutions. Okay, linear perturbation is the expanding universe. We are now in the conditions uh, to derive the equations governing linear perturbation in the expanding universe. If we make use of our definition of delta, okay, we can easily linearize the continuity equation, uh, which I wrote down before. You arrive to this uh, system, to this equation. We arrive to this equation, uh, in which you have these many terms. So we have rho b multiplying 1 plus delta. Also here, we have rho b multiplying 1 plus delta. And then you have this uh, mixed term, delta in v, which, uh, which is, of course, a nonlinear term. Then what you have to do is to keep only terms which are linear in perturbation. So for instance, uh, a term like this has to be automatically dropped, because it is at least of second order in perturbations. Uh, OK, so you go on with the calculation. You very easily arrive to this very simple relation delta dot plus 1 over a nabla with respect to x of v, that is the divergence of v with respect to x, equal to 0. Notice that every time I have a gradient with respect to x, it is accompanied by a factor 1 over a. And that has to do with the derivation that we had for this set of equations. Then we have the Poisson equation in this uh, simple form which I already derived before. And then finally, we have the linearized or equation in which basically you have to drop this term because it is of higher order. And in this term here, you have to remember that rho has to be taken to be the background value because grad p is already, is already a perturbation. OK, how to deal with the previous linear system of differential equations? Um, th there is a very simple trick that you can exploit, which is to actually Fourier transform. So you Fourier transform the fractional over density, you Fourier transform the percolar velocity, and you Fourier transform the gravitational potential. In this very simple way, notice I'm using the notation in which uh, uh, I have factor 2 pi cube uh, inside the integral, which is one of the possible notations for Fourier, for Fourier transforms. OK. Before. Uh, Dealing with the, 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 the previous equations, you have to make a choice. The choice has to do with the fact that the Euler equation involves a vector, the velocity, the velocity v. Okay? Whenever I have a vector in three dimensions in this case, uh, I can exploit a theorem due to, to Helmholtz, which tells me that uh, that vector can only be split as the sum of uh, an irrotational term, which I would call v parallel. Uh, which in turn can be written as the, uh, as the gradient of velocity potential, plus a divergenceless vertical component, component v perp, which is such that the divergence of v perp is equal to zero, uh, and similarly, the curl of v parallel is equal to zero. So, in other words, my velocity can be written as the sum of a, a zero curl term plus a zero divergence term. Now, let me come back to our situation. Uh, you can easily notice that in my previous order equation, I have no uh, terms on the right-hand side which are not the gradient of something. I had the gradient of pressure. I had the gradient of the gravitational potential. So the vertical part of my order equation has no source, a zero source. If it has zero source, it means that the left-hand side on itself has to be equal to zero. But this equation is a very simple solution, which is that v perp goes like 1 over a. In other words, v perp tends to decrease with time unavoidably. Okay? And this equation actually looks like a conservation law. It tells you that the scale factor times v perp is a constant. This very fact is a consequence of a general theorem due to Lord Kelvin, which is known as the Kelvin circulation theorem which basically tells you that vorticity, where vorticity is this combination here, is conserved along fluid lines in the absence of dissipative phenomena. So what we are saying here is that vorticity 
can at most be conserved in, the, in this sense, with the sense which I said before, a v perp is equal to zero. So v perp goes well, well, like one over a, which basically means that decays very rapidly, and we can easily for, forget it. Okay? Why? So the only relevant component of the velocity in this case is the irrotational one. From now on, I will only consider the rotational velocity component in my fluid. So now we are in the conditions to look at the uh, linearized fluid equations in Fourier space. We have continuity equation, delta k dot plus i k over a v k. Notice that before I add uh, uh, the vector k, okay, uh, multiplying v. But since we have taken all the rotational component, which is unavoidably in the direction of the wave, wave vector k, we can just write i k modulus divided by a times v k, where v k is, is the rotational component only. Other equation, in the other equation, we have the time derivative, the hvk term, the one which looked like v grad v goes to zero because it is of higher order. And then we have these two terms. This one coming from the pressure, okay? And this one coming from the gravitational potential. Of course, the rule is that whenever you have a gradient, that gradient gives rise to a factor ik multiplying my object. Similarly here, we have the Laplacian of ik, so we have ik times ik, which gives you minus k squared, and the right-hand side becomes simply the Fourier transform of delta multiplied by a time-dependent uh, factor. Okay, now, in order to obtain this equation, what you do is something very simple. You had a first-order differential equation for the uh, over-density, okay? A first-order differential equation for the velocity, and you have this algebraic relation between gravitational potential and over-density. Uh, what you can do is the following. You take the time derivative of this equation, okay, uh, which implies the delta k double dot, and you have the time derivative of this object, time derivative of this object, okay? The time derivative of v can be taken from this, okay? While, for instance, uh, uh, phi k, which is here, can be taken from the Poisson equation. So in two steps, you arrive to your second order differential equation for the density perturbation delta k which it takes this form. You have delta k double dot plus two times the upper parameter multiplying the time derivative of, derivative of delta plus a square bracket which looks very much similar to my original dispersion relation used by genes with the only difference that k is now multiplied by one over a, which, is, which has to do with the redshift evolution. And then you have this four, minus 4 pi g rho b term as we had in the genes approach. That is, once again, we have this minus sign which is signaling the existence of gravitational stability, which multiplies delta. Okay? So we have this equation here, and we, we should try to solve it. The general solution is not as simple. In some simple cases, you can solve that in terms of Bessel and normal functions, but we can simplify the game and say, at the end of the day, we are interested in exploiting those wave numbers for which we have the gravitational instability, which are those for which this term is negligible compared to this one. So let's do it immediately. Let's assume that k is much less than kj, which is obviously defined as being the one for which the square brackets uh, give you zero. And if you are in that condition, you are right to the following simplified form, delta k double dot plus 2h delta k dot minus 4 pi g rho b delta k is equal to zero. Now, the K independent, let me not notice that we are going to find solutions which do not a priori depend upon K. So we are not going to find different solutions depending on the number. But remember that we assume to be on scales above the genes K. So the, these uh, solutions are known as growing and decaying modes for reasons that will soon become, become clear. Now, let me try to solve this equation in the simplest possible setting, the one in which you say. The universe is dominated by this kind of matter, no relativistic matter, which can either be colder matter or baryons if we neglect the pressure term, and we have to, uh, we can neglect the spatial curvature. Okay, so we take zero, more precise, negligible spatial curvature, and zero, more precise, negligible pressure. If that is the case, we know that the Friedman equations uh, tell us that the scale factor grows like t to the two thirds. Uh, that the Hubble parameter is equal to t, 2 divided by 3t, and that the background density is the ratio 1 divided by 6 pi g t squared. Then you replace the solutions here, and you get this very simple form here. Solution of this equation, 
Okay? Uh, if you look at the equation, you immediately realize the following. There is a second derivative and no powers of t. First derivative is power 1 over t. No derivative is power 1 over t squared, which immediately tells you that the solution of this equation has to be looked for in uh, the form delta proportional to t to the alpha with alpha super constant. You replace the solution here, this answer is here, and you get this algebraic equation for alpha, whose solutions are alpha equal to 2 thirds and alpha equal to minus 1. So now we are in, uh, in the perfect situation to know what the, the result is. Uh, there is a growing mode which goes like to the 2 thirds, a decay mode which goes like to the minus 1. If you replace this growing and decay mode in my original set of equations, you can also immediately obtain the evolution for the velocity and for the gravitation potential. There is a growing mode for the velocity goes going like to the, to the one third, a decay mode which goes like t to the minus four thirds, while in terms of gravitational potential, you have a constant mode and a decay mode, which goes like t to the minus five thirds. That is the most important result of this discussion, okay? So, let me summarize the situation. Physical interpretation. We have therefore recovered the gravitational instability phenomenon in qualitative agreement with the original treatment by genes, but with an important difference. We no longer have exponential uh, uh, instability or exponential decay. Now we have uh, power laws in time, both for the density and, the, and, the, and for the particular velocity while the gravitational potential keeps constant in its quote-unquote growing mode. The very fact that we uh, um, change the situation from exponential growth to power law has to do with a very simple phenomenon. The universe expands, so when a fluid element tries to collapse owing to its own self-gravity, it is slowed down by the expansion of the universe. So the competition of these two effects has given rise to this uh, weaker power law uh, behavior of the, of the fluctuations. Uh, let me make a summary and discuss some consequences of what I, of what I discussed. Uh, first of all, we succeed to extend the Newtonian treatment of perturbations uh, to the cosmological framework by using uh, uh, suitable coordinates r equal to the scale factor of the universe times x and then factoring out the uh, freedom of work and background evolution. This treatment is indeed very accurate as long as we're dealing with either colder matter or baryons. In the case of baryons, since they do have some pressure, uh, what I said in the la last part of my discussion only applies to scales larger than the genes left for baryons. It's very important also to mention that if I restrict myself to uh, linear theory and to a situation we have in which I have no pressure, the three which I gave you uh, is identical to the one which I would get by using full general relativity. Um, what about other components the universe, actually that we know are present in the universe? Uh, the most important one is the uh, cosmological constant of a or any other source of dark energy that drives accelerated expansion in the universe. Uh, this can be easily accounted for and seem to imply a, a slowing down of the rotational growth of perturbations simply because of the faster expansion of the background. Uh, in other words, universal acceleration will indeed give rise to an asymptotic freezing of structure formation in accordance with the so-called cosmic Noir theorem. Uh, what about radiation? Radiation, of course, was extremely important in the past history of the universe, and this effect is also very important. Uh, when radiation and matter were interacting, the, the presence of radiation gave rise to oscillations, acoustic oscillations in the fluid, which are an unavoidable consequence of pressure gradient in the fluid itself. Uh, what about early evolution? Um, as I told you, uh, Getting the full solution of the equation is not at all a trivial task. You, can, you have to either resort to numerical techniques or uh, apply some very strong conditions of, of, uh, of symmetry, but there are some ideas of what happens in the presence of linear evolution. A simple hazard proposed by Zerdovich allows to see that the generic gravitational collapse for each fluid element is preferential along one axis thereby leading to flattened oblate ellipsoids, which are dubbed pancakes. 
But tidal interactions among nearby fluid elements also play a very important role together with accretion, merging, fragmentation, and other complex phenomena, which all conspire to give rise to the so-called cosmic web. I finish with a picture taken from a simulation uh, by Fox Springer, in which you see the, 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 this cosmic web, okay, in which you see some elements which shine, uh, which can be galaxies, clusters of sun, galaxies, etc., etc., and the underlying dark matter uh, may, uh, structure in this very, very complicated uh, picture, which we call the cosmic web.